Matthew, the first book in the New Testament, and chapter 5. Matthew and chapter 5. I have felt led to preach a brief series entitled The Blessed Life. And it's going to be focused on what are called the Beatitudes. In other words, Jesus talked about things that are blessings. And the word blessing really carries the idea of that which is fortunate, happy, enjoyable, good. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Happy Gilmore, but he talks about going to his happy place. And I've often thought about that when I go to the doctor and they want to draw blood. <laughs> yes. I think, man, I need to think, where's my happy place right yeah. now? Because I have those veins they can never find to about six stabs. After I finally get back up off the floor, they go ahead and draw the blood. And uh, I think of my happy place. And for me, my maternal grandparents, I would go to their home two weeks every summer and was absolutely spoiled rotten for two weeks. And uh, that's my happy place. Well, that's the idea. You think in your heart and mind today, where's some place you really like to be? Some place or an event or experience where you just really feel good. That's really what the word blessing is really about in the scripture here. Notice with me Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1. Seeing the crowds. Now the Lord Jesus has just been baptized. He's just experienced the wilderness ministry of temptation for 40 days. And he's just identified that he has now been sent to preach the gospel. Crowds are coming because of his teaching and because of his healing ministry. So seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Three or four things just as we begin. First of all, the place. I have had the privilege of touring Israel and have been taken to a small hill that they say is where Jesus taught this sermon. We don't know for sure that that's the case, but it's where the idea is that he was seated at the top of the hill and spoke down to those about him in the sense of his voice carrying downward to those who were listening. We don't know which hill it actually was. The Bible furthermore talks about the pupils, not only the place for the pupils. Who was he teaching? Now, we might look at this verse and initially think, well, he's teaching the crowds. But if you'll notice, it says that he went up into a mountain from the crowds, and when he was sat down, his disciples came to him. And so many Bible teachers believe this is actually not all of the crowds, but his particular followers, perhaps the 12, perhaps the 70, a smaller group. And I think when you realize his presentation, that he sat down and spoke, he probably would have not had the voice carry to a large multitude, but rather perhaps individuals. In fact, one Bible teacher who studied this says, I believe that it is the ordination address to the 12 apostles. In other words, the charge to them particularly about what the core teachings of Jesus were. Not only did he sit down, which was the rabbi's way in that time, the Jewish religious teacher, when he was walking along, he was teaching and talking, but there came a point when he really wanted to have an in-depth lesson of instruction to his followers, he would sit down. It has been called in colleges or universities the professor's chair. And it's the idea of to sit down to instruct. It's more personal, it's more informative, if you will, also, it says he opened his mouth and he taught the people. Now, to us, we would almost seem like that's kind of repetitive, that he opened his mouth and talked. But some of the Bible's teachers, again, feel that when the phrase is used, he opened his mouth, 
It is the idea that what he said on this occasion with Jesus, it would be all occasions, but for our benefit, it is made known to us that this that he's sharing is very important. Years ago, there used to be a commercial on the TV, and you'd have all kinds of people busy chattering, and all of a sudden, someone representing the financial company EF Putnam would say something. Everybody stopped, completely quiet. And the idea was when E.F. Hutton talks or speaks, people listen. And so in a sense, what Jesus is saying here, he's saying, I want you to get this. Now it's interesting about what he is saying here. It has been described by certain Bible teachers as the Magna Carta of the kingdom, the Manifesto of the King, the compendium of Christ's doctrine. What's interesting is some Bible teachers believe this is not just one sermon, but it is actually Matthew taking a series of sermons that Jesus gave and bringing them into chapters 5 through 7, giving us the core teachings of Christ. The reason they say that is if you study, many of these same teachings are also recorded in the book of Luke. But they're recorded in different places throughout the ministry of Jesus, suggesting this may be a ser series of sermons, but Matthew has compiled it, and he's saying to us, as Jesus opened his mouth and spoke from the seat of position, what I'm sharing with you, titled to us the Sermon on the Mount, is of utmost importance to those who follow me. And what is the, uh, the, the principle that he's sharing. He said blessedness. Now, we often read this like blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, if you're poor in spirit, someday you're going to be blessed. But actually, in the Greek, it's really the idea, oh, the blessedness of the one who is poor in spirit. So it's not just so much you will be blessed, you are blessed. In the sense that when you follow the Lord Jesus Christ, you are blessed now. You are beginning to experience heaven on earth. Think of it in this way. Number one, when you are rejoicing and you're following the Lord, what do you say? Praise the Lord. When you're hurting and you follow the Lord, what do you say? I need you, Lord. You know what? It's all about the Lord. That's the blessedness that is here. And that's why they're called the Beatitudes. Not just you will be blessed, you are in the pathway of blessing right now. You may not always feel like it. It's like once in a while when I'm driving during the week, somehow I think, man, I made a wrong turn. Oh boy, where am I gonna wind up? And then all of a sudden I realize I wind up where I needed to go. What a good feeling! And as a Christian, sometimes you think, where in the world am I going? <laughs> Lord, where are you taking me? <clears throat> then we see him working it out, don't we? That's the blessedness of man. I want to back down to the promise. He said, the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, there's a lot of biblical discussion on the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. I want to simplify, at least from my perspective, that Matthew generally uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. The other gospel writers use the kingdom of God, describing the same things Jesus is talking about. So I think they're interchangeable terms. And the idea is simply this. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, represented here with the concept poor in spirit, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, is represented by what we call the Lord's Prayer. Where we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, it's really a matter of saying, God, I want to be with your family, I want to be in your program, I want to be on your side, I want to be on your kingdom now and in the future. We want to be on the Lord's side now, amen? amen? Along with that, I think most folks here, when they die, they want to go to heaven. Yes. 
Okay? That's the idea of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It's you're with the Lord now, and you're going to be with the Lord forever. And so blessed then are the poor in spirit. That's the precept this morning. What does it mean, poor in spirit? Now, I mentioned to someone yesterday because they said to me, they said, what are you preaching on? I said, well, I don't like to give away my secrets, but I'm preaching on poor in spirit. They said, oh, you mean you're preaching on depression? I said, not exactly. <laughs> I said, that's not really what poor in spirit means in this context. Okay, what poor in spirit really means is twofold in the sense, um, let's say that you go to the fair and you see a funnel cake. It is covered with powdered sugar, whipped cream, and a big strawberry on top. A little chocolate sauce sprinkled into it. And you think, oh man, that looks so good. And Pull out your pockets or open your purse and zero. And then someone walks up whom you know and they say, What are you doing? Well, I'm just looking at these funnel cakes. <laughs> I just don't have any money. Well, here, let me buy it for you. Good, I'll take two. <laughs> What's the idea? The idea is you have nothing. But they have what you need. And they can find it. To be poor in spirit in the mind of Christ, I believe, is that spiritually speaking, we have nothing as far as deserving God's blessing. God has everything and he wants to bless us. That's poor in spirit. Along with that, one, uh, one uh, definition I came across I really like. This teacher said, empty before God. In other words, I don't have anything, but you do. Let me give you three thoughts this morning about this idea of poor in spirit. The first, I want to speak about prayers from Luke 18. The Bible says two fellows went to church. One was a Pharisee, which was an extremely rigid religious person. And the other was, in the old King James, called a publican. Now, we see it today translated as a tax collector. And believe me, they were not generally religious, rigid people as far as good things were concerned. Generally, the tax collectors or publicans were looked down on in Jewish society because, number one, they worked for the hated Roman government. And number two, they usually collected more than they were supposed to and lined their own pockets. So they were often mentioned as the bottom of the barrel. I read one little story, it was good, uh, years ago when this preacher was using the King James Version and it happened to be about election time in their community, like it is uh, getting to be in our communities, and uh, it was funny because he sent in his weekly title to the local newspaper, and they would put the sermon title in the newspaper, and so he sent one about Luke 18, and it was what Jesus saw in a public. And... The next, on Monday, he called the editor of the newspaper and said, I want to thank you. He said, I have the biggest crowd at church that I've ever had. The guy said, wow, what happened? He said, well, you misprinted my title. You said what Jesus saw in a Republican. And he said, man, I had a crowd like you wouldn't believe. And so, uh, but tax collector is the idea. Now, the Pharisee, the very rigid, religious person came in. Here was his prayer according to Luke 18. The Bible says he prayed and he said, Lord, I thank you. I'm not a robber. I'm not a murderer. I'm not an adulterer. And I'm not even like this tax collector. He said, I tithe and I fast twice a week. And the Bible says the tax collector came into the temple. He couldn't even lift his head toward heaven. He smote himself on his chest and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, he went home right with God, not the other guy. You know the problem with the Pharisee's prayer? He was not poor in spirit. You know why? Because number one, he came into the house of God complimenting himself. <coughs> Let me tell you what worship is. When you come into the house of God and you compliment God, Amen. that is worship. 
You sing of him. You adore him. You pray to him. You praise him. You honor his word. You honor his people. That's the idea. Not complimenting yourself. Complimenting him. And then number two, not comparing yourself. I'm going to guarantee you. Anybody can walk into this church and say, I'm a better Christian than Pastor Tim. Big deal. You don't compare yourself to one another. You compare yourself to God. You know, I do a lot of funerals, a lot of them. And every now and then I attend a funeral where somebody gets up and they talk glowingly about the deceased. I mean, this person never said a mean word. This person just financially gave to every cause under the sun. This person fed the hungry. This person loved the family. This person was perfect. And you know, as I sit there listening to those eulogies, I find myself sinking down in my chair, thinking, man, I hate to die. Because when they talk about me, it ain't going to be like that. <laughs> In a sense, brothers and sisters, when you come in before the majesty and the holiness and the marvelousness of God, it's almost like, whoa, <laughs> look at him, not me. Amen. The other fellow couldn't even look up. He just said, I need your mercy. He was poor in spirit. Number two, I want you to think of a principle seen in some of the Old Testament scriptures. For example, in Psalm chapter 120, Psalm 127, and verse 1. Except the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. In other words, you can make a mansion. But if God doesn't keep it, it can fall apart or burn down. Amen. I remember Nebuchadnezzar who built the hanging gardens of Babylon, the great walls of Babylon, the great king who was really considered a world conqueror, and he stood on those walls and says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? And God turned him into an animal for seven years till he came back to his senses, and he said, I want to tell you something. There's nobody like the God of Daniel. Unless you, unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain to build it. You're dependent on God. How about Psalm, or Proverbs chapter uh, 21, verse 31? The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but safety or victories of the Lord. You can have the biggest tank, you can have the fastest horse, you can have the strongest weapons, but unless God gives you the victory, you're not going to have it. Amen. Remember Goliath and David? Goliath was the more powerful one, but God gave David the victory. You're dependent on God. You come to Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 33, and the Bible says there the idea that if you cast the lot, really the decision of it is from the Lord. In other words, people in that day and time would roll the dice for decision. But ultimately, God even controls that. Do you remember when there were two men who were chosen to replace Judas Iscariot as the 12th apostle? There was Justice and there was Matthias. And they rolled the dice saying, Lord, you got it. And Matthias was chosen. I actually like that from a perspective. Nobody can say, well, this guy was more popular than that guy. What he's saying was, Lord, you are the one, according to Proverbs, who ultimately controls even the roll of the dice. Depending on the Lord. And then Proverbs 16 and verse 9, what does the Bible say? It says, a man in his heart plans his steps, but the Lord directs his way. Amen. Have you ever made plans and then they didn't quite work out? The idea is you can plan your life, but ultimately what happens is in the Lord's hands. In every case, those verses say to us again and again and again, yes, plan, yes, prepare, yes, expect, but ultimately, always acknowledge, ultimately, it depends on God. That'll help you be poor in spirit. And then finally, James chapter 4 and verse 15. The Bible says in verses 14 and 15, it says, James said, now some of you are saying, boy, I'm going to go into a city and buy and sell for a year and make money and et cetera. He says, here's what you ought to say. If the Lord wills, we'll do this and we'll do that. 
See, now, from the south, a lot of times down south, they say, hey, I'll see you next week, Lord willing. In other words, they were recognizing that ultimately, I can plan to see you next week. I can't guarantee it. Yes. Only God knows. And God keeps. Now, again, down south, they added to it. Well, I'll see you next week. Good Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. <laughs> with the creek, how the creek got in there. But uh, the idea is simply this. And how many times that's convicted my own heart when I've said to something, somebody, I'll do that. And then it's like I've been convicted. And then they're bad, Lord will I? Because it is ultimately in his hands. And you know what? When you look at the plans of your life and you say, this is what I plan for, this is what I hope for, Lord will I? That keeps you poor in spirit. When you look at all those verses in Psalms and Proverbs that say you can plan, you can prepare, you can do this, you can do that, but ultimately, it's God's choice. That keeps you poor in spirit, humble. And then finally, when you come into the house of God or you go before the Lord God, you don't come bragging on yourself. And you don't come looking at anybody else and say, boy, I'm glad I'm not like that. I would just say, God, you're so great. Compared to you, I'm poor in spirit. When it comes to the matter of salvation, did you catch that hymn we sang? Rock of Ages? It said, In my hand, no price I bring. <coughs> to thy cross I cling. You see, Every, most every year, the last several years, I've been baptized in the Monongahela. I mean, I, I've done the polar bear plunge in the Monongahela River on January the 1st. And you jump in about three or four feet, and like Ashley, the water's cold. In fact, it's brutal. And you turn around and make your way back about five or six feet and then somebody reaches down now i could drag myself up and out but they give me a helping hand that's not salvation that's not poor in spirit what salvation is is when i jumped out too far the current carries me out deeper the water has frozen my muscles i can barely scream and i can't swim and I can't save myself, and I'm going under. And the life hope comes and pulls me out. That is the poor in spirit. When you recognize, Father, there's nothing I can do. It's all of you. <clears throat> save my soul and bless my life. Yes, I'll call. Yes, I'll prepare. Yes, I'll plan. But it's all. If the Lord wills. That's a poor spirit. And it says those who enter the kingdom and are in the kingdom of heaven. That's what I want to be. How about you? <laughs> Father in heaven, Lord, I'm humbled to <laughs> teach about what Jesus taught. And I confess to you, Father, and I confess to our congregation, I, I tremble in a sense because I don't want to misrepresent what poor in spirit means. But I also want us to get it and to be it. Because Jesus said that is truly the blessed life. Help us. Let's stand and sing. Jamie, what is our song? Uh, tonight.